Hello, everybody. Welcome to the SIT Insights in Technology Virtual Nano Conference. Thank you all for joining us today. We're thrilled to have you. My name is Mark Barton. I'll be your guide, your host, your moderator through today's massive day, the day when SIT launches this new MSc program in computer science and software engineering. Do we have a packed agenda for you today? Before I hand you over to the Chief Executive Officer of Acronis, the founder of SIT, Dr. Sergei Belousov, I just want to rattle through what's on the agenda today. Following Dr. Belousov, we'll be hearing from Professor Maripetse on smart ecosystems and the impact for the SIT master's programs. Following that, we'll have this panel on the future of computing. Then we'll have another main speaker, Professor Arta Eckert on the future of quantum information. Following that, there'll be a panel on the quantum era today. Then we move the focus to cyber security concepts. We're going to have a wonderful speech by Dr. Barry L. McManus, he'll join the following panel on the 360 degrees of cyber security. And after that, as if that wasn't enough, we'll be hosting your questions, which of course you can fire at the bottom of your screen in the Q&A function. We'll be asking your questions on this MSc course in computer science and software engineering that we're launching today at SI. T. That's something to look forward to at the end of today's session. First up, before further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Sergei Balausov, who, of course, is the Acronis Chief Executive Officer and the founder of the Schaffhausen Institute of Technology. Dr. Balausov, I hand the floor over to you. Uh, we believe that the world is converting to be digital and digital workloads. The workloads, which are bits and bytes, uh, are actually zeros and ones, are very, very fragile. They could be easily destroyed. They could be easily copied, and so they need protection. Uh, there are these uh, five challenges protecting digital workloads. There is uh, uh, potentially 500 billion digital workloads in 2030, based in one billion locations, so very, very complex to protect them. Uh, there is um, about 500 zettabytes of data, which is 10 times more data than there is today. Every autonomous car can generate uh, four terabytes of data each day, one petabyte of data each year or more. Uh, of course, security, industrialization of cybercrime, uh, every digital workload can be attacked. Uh, privacy, which we are learning to be a major concern, and the only way to actually be protected from the privacy standpoint is to have not only production platform, but also protection platform. And finally, especially with the current situation with COVID-19, we all have learned that without digital workload, we cannot operate. So basically today, everything we want to do, uh, food, water, uh, shelter, and air, well, perhaps air is available, but everything else uh, is requiring um, digits to maintain and to support. And so it has to work at all times. Uh, so there is a great similarity between biological hazards and, and um, actually physical hazards. Uh, in case of biological hazards, uh, COVID-19 have educated all the um, civilized world that there are these five aspects which need to be orchestrated and integrated fashion in order to be uh, feeling safe. One is you need to have good prevention, such as social distancing, vaccination, good hygiene. Super important to have good detection. We all learned how important it is to have accessibility of tests in the early stages of this COVID-19. Uh, uh, response to be able to actually cure and uh, at uh, address the attack correctly, and it should not be too much for immune system either. Uh, recovery uh, and uh, availability of uh, actually uh, hospital beds for that. And finally, forensic, to be able to do prevention, detection, and response. You have to understand what was going on with your body and with the with population. This is extremely similar with uh, computer viruses and computer uh, digital attacks. You need to do things like vulnerability assessment, patch management, 
uh, you need to do AI threat prevention uh, detection in, in, in for detection. You need to be able to respond uh, in real time better than afterwards. You need to be able to recover if disease actually were not able to be uh, fended off with your immune system. And uh, you need to understand uh, what was happening uh, uh, with your uh, digital infrastructure and digital workloads to be able to avoid have, having this happen again. We believe that um, our mission is to protect all data applications and systems. And to protect is not just related to security, it's also related to authenticity. You need to make sure that every uh, data is original and you need to be able to see where is a replica, where is original, and if original was modified. Who has access to your data? And, and access to your data allows to effectively control your free will. Accessibility, you have to be able to access your workload at all times. And um, you have to, of course, make sure that nothing gets lost and you can recover if something gets lost. And you need to do it in such a way that it's very easy, very cost efficient, secure. You don't lose control. There is no point protecting your privacy by losing privacy. And um, it needs to be extremely reliable because effectively it is as important. You can leave several minutes without air. You can leave uh, several days uh, without water. Uh, you can leave several weeks without food. Uh, but you know, I don't know how many, how, how long you can live without digital workloads today and how long you would be able to live in the future. And for that, we have Acronis. Uh, Acronis is um, headquartered in Schaffhausen. There is a second headquarter in Singapore. I'm talking to you from Singapore today. Uh, we were founded in 2003 in Singapore. We moved into Switzerland and to Schaffhausen. So answering in advance, one of the questions why in Schaffhausen, because Acronis is in Schaffhausen, so I'm coming to Schaffhausen from actually 2006. Uh, we are a medium-sized company. We're growing very rapidly and we are accelerating. We are uh, very pervasive. We are basically supporting 100% of all large businesses. And our expertise, artificial intelligence, software engineering, and um, application of artificial intelligence to business and to interesting areas like sports with our CyberFit program is what we do. Now, this is just a very small subset of human problems. If you think about the problems of the real world, they are much more broader. And, and that actually opens a huge opportunity uh, for many, many different things. So we live in the world which is um, definitely suffering from diseases. We just seen it and aging is one of the most important diseases today, which we don't really have an answer for. Environment and global warming, Interestingly enough, we can see that it's, oh, it's sort of contradictory with diseases. We were all quarantined and so environment improved by much today. Social justice and poverty, very unfortunate reason for wars and violence. And of course, there are space and universe challenges, uh, which if not addressed, uh, humankind would not exist for uh, many millions of years, maybe many thousands of years, but not much longer. Now, we know that um, uh, Based on modern science, effectively everything in the universe is a computer. Um, so universe itself is a quantum computer. And so you can use computers to predict the universe. For example, no biotechnology today happens without computers. And the vaccine uh, is actually um, made using computers before it is made using chemistry, before it is tested using biology and, and um, uh, life sciences. And, and so it is definitely important to have better computers. What is actually computers? So computers are effectively Turing machines. This is one sort of very old computer. Um, and, and so um, the modern computers are equivalent to um, machines um, uh, invented, uh, abstract object invented by Alan Turing. What we use today uh, is CPUs, uh, graphic processing using GPUs, Tensor processing using TPUs, all of these are actually Turing machines and they could be modeled on a modern Turing machine. Uh, these computers are not perfect for some of the modern workloads. One of the main workloads which is coming our way is really deep learning and artificial intelligence. And so you have a number of designs to address it. Neuromorphic designs similar to human brain, uh, you know, the, the one on the left, one and two, the one in the middle, which is slightly more complicated with elements of uh, randomization, so more similar to human 
neurons, photonic designs, which um, actually are much more power efficient uh, and much more parallel uh, versus uh, silicon computers, uh, also gives a promise to better deep learning engines. Now, ultimately, the modern silicon computers were governed by um, uh, the Moore law, which was that um, number of transistors and resistors on the chip double every 24 months. And, and there are a number of limits with digital computers related to performance and throughput, power consumption, transistor size for silicon computers. And in general, there is this limits on the left, fundamental hard limits for digital computers. So there is Margolis and Levitin limit. Uh, and with the current progress with computation, we will grow to a hard limit in 75 years. There is Bremen limit. 60 years, there is organization which predicts that uh, the silicon computers will stop accelerating in several years. Uh, one of the renowned um, experts in computer complexity, Scott Aronson, estimates that we will hit hard limits in digital computers in 25 years. So in 25 years, we will make computers which will no longer be significantly better per square, per cubicle, um, uh, millimeter or cubical centimeter and per amount of power. And that's very sad because there is this two very simple problems and there is many other problems which we will not be able to solve on those computers. For example, many body problem which allows us to predict behavior of matter and make new materials and so on and so forth. Uh, or even such a benign problem which is underlying all of the modern encryption, large integral prefactorization and many other similar problems. Um, and, and so uh, for that, there are some other computers which have been invented. So our upcoming revolution is uh, quantum computing and other possibilities. This is a picture of a, a Google record-breaking quantum computer as of October 2019. There is a, a misunderstanding that those computers are huge devices. They're not really. This is a sort of human-sized device. In fact, the computation unit is very small. This diagram describes the uh, quantum supremacy, basically Google for the first time in human history been able to create a computer, quantum computer, which can solve the uh, problem um, much faster than any classical computer possibly. Uh, so within several seconds, something which will take thousands of years on a most powerful digital computer. So this is some of the designs of these computers. Um, you know, this is the designs which I personally think are most promising called Atoms. Uh, this is Michel Lukin group, uh, my classmate in Harvard. Uh, Iron Traps, uh, which is a commercial company, IonQ in Maryland. And then superconducting units in the industry, Google, IBM, and Rigetti. There are non-quantum computers which may be useful application for CERN, like Black Hole. Apparently, Black Hole allows the fastest in terms of frequency computation, 10 in the power of 35. So for a simple super parallel computation, you might end up making a small black hole in CERN. And maybe that explains what happened to most of the um, alien civilizations. They reach a stage when they can produce small black holes, made a mistake and got consumed into black hole. And of course, um, you can also think about um, advanced materials computers. For example, for storage, there is definitely a superior computational um, uh, uh, capacity of DNA-based computers. So this is a one company, Catalog DNA, also from Cambridge, Massachusetts, producing super dense memory, which also can do some computation. Now, um, if we think about limits of computation, we should not forget that every human carries in their head most advanced computer of all. Uh, this is human brain. So if you think about human body, it's 200 billion atoms. Uh, in the single DNA, which then generates 40 trillion cells in our body. So our body is quite large, uh, which has 100 billion very large um, uh, new cells, uh, which are called neurons in our brain, which actually have 100 trillion connections and it has only 10 watt power consumption and weights only about 1.5 kilos, anywhere from one to two kilos. And in fact, the weight doesn't exactly correlate to the ca compute capacity. And in fact, today, if we think about the most amazing problem which stands in, in, in front of us in terms of science, we don't really understand how the brain works. It's not even clear that we know all the physics which is happening in the, in the human brain. 
if we know all the physics around such powerful human gener uh, knowledge generation devices, and, and in general, it is not clear um, how uh, this can influence our science. Of course, there are people who think it's just um, uh, um, a warm, wet Turing machine, but there are also people who think this is something beyond any digital computer. Um, now, with that, we can not notice that um, besides uh, solving such problems like creating an artificial human, there are more benign uh, problems to be solved, like uh, robots, sensors, and actuators are very, very, you know, funny. If you think about birds and planes, uh, planes are very awkward and very uh, much unable to fly, believe it or not, but um, uh, bats or owls can fly through a dark forest and squeeze between um, the branches uh, as no drone in the next probably 30 or 50 years will be able to. And, um, you know, this Boston Robotics dog, which is running uh, on the streets of Singapore in a very awkward way, noticing to humans to stay socially distant, uh, can actually flip, but it flips um, uh, in a very awkward way if you compare the grace of this uh, wonderful creation of human civilization into a normal dog or less so a cat, it's completely crazy. And for that, you need better, uh, better robots, sensors, and actuators. Um, uh, photonic quantum repeaters, advanced materials, data storage, healthcare, all of this needs much better computers that we can afford today with silicon chips. One specific area, and I'm sure Artur will cover some of it today, is a quantum internet. Today we're all seated at home and we all rely on digital information. This information are very easy copied and so we can lose our privacy, very easily manipulated so we can lose our security. The only way for us to really keep a secret is quantum communication and um, belief in the fact that humans have free will. And there is a wonderful article which is written by Arthur and actually Renato Renner uh, the Swiss scientist who works for ETH about how to keep a secret. You know, I recommend to read it. Um, Arthur may talk about it. The wonderful thing about the modern architectures is that once we create all these different computers, we don't need to choose. We can combine them into one of those clouds. And in fact, many of those clouds already combine CPU, TPU, and GPU. And some of them already added quantum computers. And I'm sure some of them will add advanced materials and other computers into sort of a fantasy mainframes. So here you have CPU, GPU, TPU, and this is one of the architectures, open source architectures. And you can have Memristor, Photonics, quantum computers, black holes, uh, very special analog computers, and even brain power of humans uh, attached to this machine. Now, in order to build the new computers on the right of that picture, you need new advanced materials, which is physics. You need to build new hardware, which is physics and engineering may much so is engineering. You need new software to design them. Very much a progress of modern computers is related to the progress of software being able to design it. Think about modern uh, silicon chip. It has 1.2 trillion uh, transistors, if you talk about uh, chips designed for artificial intelligence by Cerebras. Um, and, and how can you put one to trillion without a software together. It requires new operating systems completely different from what we have today, like Mac OS X on the slide with Steve Jobs, and new applications. And for that challenge, we decided to build a new institutions in Schaffhausen, which we believe is the best location for such institution, which is computers, physics, and business, focused on science, technology, and research, making um, unrestricted revenue streams and getting all sources of funding to be able to do science technology, business, and education in those areas, specifically focused on cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, software engineering, and robotics, and autonomous machine in case of computers, quantum technology, and advanced materials, which are very specific fields of physics, and uh, various business sciences related to science transformation. Reality is that to build even such a desired and simple conceptually device as autonomous car, which is happily running on the streets of Schaffhausen, uh, but not extremely well, you need to have combination of all of these technologies. Ideally, autonomous cars drive much better than humans. We are very far from it today. 
which is evident from the RoboRace uh, track which we've started. Now, in order to build it, first of all, we uh, start from scratch in Schaffhausen. We created an alliances with top-notch institutions like Carnegie Mellon and National University of Singapore, and we built a top-notch um, boards, strategic advisory board focused on uh, scientists and scientific directions, headed by Konstantin Novoselov, who is a Nobel Prize winner in physics, expert in advanced materials based in National University of Singapore and University of Manchester. Nicolas Rizan in the University of Geneva, who is probably the most cited living physicist out of Switzerland. Arthur Eckert, who will speak later today, who works in NUS, National University of Singapore, University of Oxford. Misha Lukin, author of the, one of the most promising design and quantum computers in Harvard University, and Mark Kamlet, who is a former provost of Carnegie Mellon. Representative board of directors, we believe the modern university and um, science, technology, and business clusters need to run like businesses. Uh, good team already on, on the ground, running and doing work full time. A uh, strong industry board because we believe in deeply fundamental science with immediate application. And uh, we also assembled group of friends of the university, which we call SIT Union, which is ready to help in a variety of ways, not necessarily full time, but being involved, being able to give lectures, uh, talk to you guys, and, and so on and so forth. Now, with that, I wanted to talk about our master program. This year, we're only launching 2020 master program in computer science and software engineering. It is a sort of a standard description of the program as it is today. As we go next year, we will have two programs in quantum science, computing, computer science, software engineering, quantum technology, and advanced materials. And as we move forward, we will also launch business sciences and science transformation programs. Again, this year, this is only computer science and software engineering program. And what is different about this program? Really two things. So first of all, we are focused on building leaders for small, medium, and large projects. Small, medium, and large projects are really what you will actually have in the modern science and in the modern business. It's very unlikely that you will have a project which will have one guy uh, which will be able to code by himself for 10 years and have one product which will be amazing. It happens, but it's not common. And so typically for a startup, you should think about medium-sized project or large project. Medium size is 100 people, 10 years, 1,000 many years, 10 to 100 releases, requires group of leaders to lead this. And larger project is what we have in Acronis, for example, 1,000 people, 10 years, tens of thousands of many years, hundreds of releases. And so all of the people listed on the left side, all of these roles are needed. Some of the roles are quite unusual. For example, chief engineer and chief architect are two very different roles. For example, chief idea officer and chief technology officer are two very different roles as well. This year, we are focused on these five roles, chief architect, very important role for a software which have many releases over a long period of time. Chief product officer, very important for you to be able to make money and to satisfy your customers from your product. And again, your customers may be different scientists. Chief program officer, uh, which is, uh, of course, um, uh, the uh, person who describe the requirements deeply enough to be, able, to be able to give it to engineers to code the product. Chief development officer, which is, of course, a person who needs to understand architecture, the product, the program, and every aspect, but mostly manage people. And with modern software, very important role with chief security officer, which we as Acronis hope to convert to a new role of chief protection officer for every company. Uh, we will also touch with our program on chief science and chief design. The important thing is that nowhere in the world you really get education required to, uh, to, to be leader. Instead, you are taught to be an engineer. You stand taught to be a very solid beginner. Now, what is the difference? This is a sort of the list of areas which is different. First of all, in order to learn how to be a leader, you need to learn about leaders and need to be involved with leaders. And we believe we assembled very advanced group of people on our different boards who will all participate in um, connecting with our students uh, to give them example, to give them uh, mentorship, uh, to give them teaching if they will teach. Then, of course, entrepreneurship, something which is very specific, starting the project um, and finishing it, it's, of course, important in 
if you start your own business, but it's not even less important when you actually work in a large company. Then, of course, management. Management can be explained for computer scientists in the form of game theory, in the form of um, the program, and it's required for you to be able to, uh, to succeed with your project. If you achieve development officer, mostly what you do, you manage a team of leaders. Change management in software and in science, it's extremely important. It's about constant change. Science of people, what you really do about building any project is actually from zero to the time in 10 years, you will, in a thousand people project, interview thousands of people, including internal people, including partners, including people who you would need to hire. And so you really need to understand people really well. Understanding how business is running, very, very important, uh, because what we build today in science is connected to business, but definitely in technology, it makes no sense outside of the business. Our code needs to be made into product, which needs to be made into uh, something you can market, which needs to be sold, and that all can be explained in the language of computer scientists to a computer scientist. And there is two specific areas of science, quantum informatics, which we believe will become very important with the presence of quantum computers, which are already available and will be more available over the coming years, and science of advanced materials, which is very much based on computers. And so with that, I conclude my speech. Uh, what you can do now, you can think of this um, wonderful uh, uh, three examples on the right. Alan Turing um, definitely um, took some time for him to be on the banknote uh, and Bank of England, the founder, of course, in, in some ways of a Turing Award, the most prestigious award in computer science. John Bardeen, the guy who actually invented a lot of what we use today in uh, our computation, the basics of our hardware is transistors. Hopefully, at some point, we will also use superconductors, will be very useful. Um, and of course, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, which is the ultimate examples of super successful graduates of super successful master program in Stanford. So what you can do now, you can actually uh, protect yourself with chronic cyber protection, which will help the university indirectly. Uh, you can join us as a researcher or faculty. We are looking for people. Uh, we are looking for investors. We are looking for people who want to support us. And of course, we are looking for students. So you can become as famous as Alan Turing. You can get Nobel, two, two Nobel Prize like John Bardeen. And of course, uh, hopefully you can build startup, maybe not as successful as Google, but almost. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bella Usov. To become as famous as Alan Turing, that in itself should be inspiration for all the students watching today. Thank you for that wonderful introduction on the future of computing, Dr. Bella Usov. We're gonna be seeing a lot more of you Today is all about these three sessions, the first on the future of computing, then we're gonna talk about quantum information, and then finally about cyber security. So without further ado, just wanna tell you about one thing. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a lovely Q&A function. Please click on that and ask your questions. And at the end of today, for about 15 minutes, we will be answering questions from you, the audience, and thank you all for attending today. We've got hundreds and hundreds of attendees. We're so excited you were able to join us today on this very special day, the day of this launch of this MSc course in computer science and software engineering at the Schaffhausen Institute of Technology. But just to reiterate, do press that button, that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can fire questions at us. And at the end of the day, we'll be answering all your questions, something to look forward to. So a big thanks again to Dr. Bella Usov. I wanna just move on to the Professor of Software Engineering at SIT, Mauro Petze. Professor Petze will be sharing his expertise on the subject, seamless testing, smart ecosystems. And before I hand it over, Professor Petze to you, the man who'll be in charge of the panel that follows your speech is Jürgen Brucker who is the Executive Vice President of SIT. So after Professor Petze finishes, I'll be handing seamlessly over to Jürgen Brucker. Professor Petze, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm moving from, from, from future to, to today. Uh, let me 
C, okay. So we are talking about, uh, uh, you know, Talking about after Sergey is a tough job because you know you give this broad and fantastic and long long vision uh, with the master. Uh, but uh, you know it's not just talking long 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 term. But we are looking at today. Today we have SID. We have a, a small but active university, and we are active in many areas. Few, the, the, one of the few areas we are active in is uh, is software testing, is software engineering. And I like to tell you something about a little things, which is what we call uh, testing smart ecosystems. Uh, I need to find out how, I, okay, starting smart ecosystem. So uh, the question is, uh, what uh, what do we mean by ecosystem? What, what do we mean by why we actually are interested in, uh, in, uh, in smart ecosystems? And what do we do in uh, in uh, in SAP? And I start with what, okay. Uh, does anybody know what a smart ecosystem is? Or is that actually one of these uh, buzzwords that uh, we uh, computer scientists invent to actually get some some papers and some information? No, actually, smart ecosystems are very very important in our life. Okay, so let me give you a, a fairly uh, simple example. Okay, what are smart ecosystems? Uh, smart ecosystems are systems that actually. Uh, provide a non-deterministic behavior uh, to serve people needs what do you mean well that's one example smart grids today you know we moved from the classic they would call in uh, talking about computer science uh, client service uh, uh, scenario where you have big power plants producing uh, energy and many users uh, to what is called the smart grid everybody produces a power uh, can produce uh, can produce uh, energy, everybody can consume energy. Today, energy is not anymore mainly produced by large plants, but it's produced by single homes, single factories, single plants, uh, different kinds of plants. People can enter and exit uh, the, the system. Everybody owns its own uh, small, uh, small system. So we have a, we have a market of, of energy. And this is actually a big amount of, uh, of, uh, of system is a huge system that we use in everyday life. And as you say, there is no central ownership. You know, you have your own solar panels to uh, create your energy and you sell energy in the market. You have your, uh, uh, your system that consumes uh, energy in the market and uh, you really have a system where you don't actually you don't know who is in the market at the moment people can enter and exit depending on what they need depending on what they can produce let me go ahead and look another thing which is uh, what they call public area control systems okay what are public area control systems well uh, let me give you uh, this information you know we are used to this uh, big security guards sitting in these uh, hidden rooms uh, looking at security issues not only, not anymore. Uh, when we are talking about a big station, when you're talking about a big airport, you're talking a big mall, when you're talking a big, a big area, uh, what happens right now is that it's not just a matter of uh, cameras and security, but it's more and more information to the users. You get information where to go, what to do. Uh, we are monitor driven. It's, you know, in this era is also a pandemic element. You know, you actually want to see distance of people. So again, and this is a system that grows forever. So there are no, uh, no system boundaries in in the system in general uh, and so that's another interesting element and now let me go ahead a bit more and talk about another one which is uh, uh, <clears throat> autonomous vehicles okay uh, what do we mean by autonomous vehicles okay we are used to uh, this element where you actually have uh, 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 one single self-driving car, we get excited. You know, get excited, you jump to the car, you drive your car, and you don't drive it anymore. You know, the car brings you around. Think about a bigger environment. Think about a system where you have several different cars moving together, uh, uh, interacting together. Now we get something which is not only no central ownership. Every uh, every different element has a different, every different owner car has a different owner. No uh, system boundaries, but also it's evolving and contradicting requirements. Everybody wants to go first and very fast at home, but we cannot both get home as fast as possible. We need to find trade-off. We need to find uh, uh, elements. We need to understand what the requirements are. What is uh, what the, what we can do in the contradiction. But let me move on a bit and uh, go to the. What I think is actually the, the smart ecosystem uh, by definition, which is a smart city. Okay. Now, there is one thing that I really consider like uh, the most interesting evolution of these systems. You know, we've been used for half a century to use software. 
example. You know, we have this very nasty terminal term, which is uh, users, which uh, software engineers share with drug dealers. You know, we have users of some something users, drug users of technology, and we have this idea that you actually have sit down and you use the system. No. Did you get a, a manual when you entered uh, Oslo last time you went to Oslo or when you entered uh, Munich or when you entered uh, Paris? These are smart cities. I started with Oslo because it's probably the most advanced smart city. You know, you are not interacting with a smart city in the way you interact with any kind of software. You are not interacting with your uh, public control area in the way you interact with software. You are talking about uh, being part of the system. When you talk about the smart city, obviously there is no central ownership. Obviously, you don't know who are the system in the city. Obviously, you have no system boundaries. Obviously, you have the last scale. Obviously, you have uh, evolving and leaking requirements. But more than that, the people are in the system. So we are moving from like a specialized system, people talking about software engineering, to what we talk about smart engineering. You know, we need to engineer the whole system where the people walking in the street are actors, primary actors of the of the system, as everybody else. Now. Uh, let me see, you know, the why. I think, you know, I gave you a very interesting uh, uh, suggestion of uh, what do we do. Okay, now uh, we want to go to the, uh, to the part, which is why. You know, we're talking about the whole digital world. You know, we are not talking more anymore about, you know, like a center, a mall, an airport, an application. We are talking about the whole digital world. The whole digital world is going to be one single big system where software, where hardware, where devices, where uh, people, where AI, where machine learning will all cooperate to make our life easier and more interesting. So uh, I think, you know, it's really important to actually understand that this is not just something that uh, is, uh, will be here in the future, it is here today. And now what we do is, uh, why? Why we actually care about that? Of course, because they're important, but is, there, is it different to care about a, a large system or a small system? Didn't we learn a lot in the last half a century of software engineering about, you know, how to build big, reliable, uh, useful systems. So what are the challenges and the open issues? <clears throat> Challenge number one, changing requirements. Smart cars, smart cities, smart environment, there is no single correct result. What does it mean that this is city to be correct? There is no, not even the meaning of correctness. You know, we are talking about multiple acceptance behaviors that may vary unpredictably over time. You know, you don't know what will be the best or the correct behavior model. Don't even talk about correctness. You talk about, you know, acceptable, use nice behavior. And so we actually move in a different uh, environment. Second big challenge is uh, non-deterministic behavior. Okay, so uh, we are talking about uh, a system which do not behave in one single way. I have a very simple example here. I have like a, a one small scale, if you want to say, uh, a smart system, which is P2P ride sharing. You know, Uber, if you want to say some, some name, you know, you have a, a customer, you have a car, and you have a route where the car, the car have actually predefined pre pre route for the car to pick up the customer. And now suddenly you have a, a flash mob was not predictable at all and the car has to everything has to be redefined and non-deterministically evolving towards what we call an acceptable behavior now i'm sure you know i just want to see whether there is a question about we can predict a flash mob come on this is actually the most challenging part of the talk because talking about unpredictable things if i actually give you an example of unpredictable it becomes predictable because you have an example but i give you an example of unpredictable which i actually love uh, which is a friend of mine. A friend of mine is working on a, a diet control system. Oh, that's very nice, you know, because, uh, you know, it's a system which is works with smart watches or smart devices. You, you have a smart watch on your own and uh, you start uh, eating and, you know, you're not uh, interacting, you know, you're not actually getting, asking questions, getting things. Simply the system monitors the movement of the, of the arm and monitors uh, the, 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 the element that you touch and uh, it computes, you know, uh, how much calories you get into, into your mouth by having eaten so many times, uh, so much for, for so long, uh, your favorite spaghetti. Now, my friend lives actually and works in Singapore, so 
uh, he found out that uh, the system was working perfectly for uh, Western style eating, and then it was completely different for uh, uh, for uh, Eastern style eating. Oh uh, yeah, can't you imagine that people eat also with chopsticks? Of course you can. But more than that, uh, he had the system working. He was working on that great, and then it got, it got it suddenly got uh, people using a lipstick or people smoking. Say you know, see analogous kind of movement, and this grew up the system. So again, it was completely unpredictable. So we have requirements that change and, pre and behavior that changes unpredictably. Now, one more element which is unavoidable failures. Okay. Uh, now, uh, this is my favorite topic because I work on testing. I can actually spend uh, you know, my whole life telling you about avoidability and availability of failures. I don't want to spend too much. But I have a few examples. The Mars Climber Orbiter, which is basically a few years ago, we lost the Mars Climber Orbiter, which is a big complex Mars system. We lost it in the space with tens of billions of, uh, of, uh, uh, of dollars lost just because of a stupid problem. Uh, we have uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, blackout on uh, the uh, East Coast. Uh, uh, one day, no electric power for the whole day for millions of people. We had uh, uh, millions of passengers of United sitting down because uh, the uh, the boarding system was not working. We have uh, accidents uh, with, with self-driving car. So basically, uh, we have this environment where we need to deal with systems that are not uh, uh, not commonly used. So I give you basically, uh, for, remember, you know, we have uh, uh, um, uh, evolving requirement, unpredictable behavior, unavoidable failures. So we move from something which we have been working so, uh, so far, which is properties. You know, you have uh, people like me who've been working on software correctness, software liability, software robustness, software safety, software security, software performance, software usability. We need to work on system health. We need to work and get in an idea that we want to actually understand to what extent a system is continuing the coping with the environment. And this is the inspiration from human health, okay? So we are talking about system health, we're talking about uh, uh, something which is not just correct, it's not some secure, it's not uh, safe, it's actually healthy, okay? And another thing is actually another major challenge is we are moving from uh, Test, develop, test, develop, move to the field, maintain the software, pray. No, this is not true anymore. We are going from developing and field a, a, as a single progressive element where you actually test and heal, test and heal, test and heal all the time. Okay, so, uh, so we are moving from a classic element to what I call field testing and uh, healing, okay, which is... Uh, a generating, we need to generate tests for changing requirements. Never heard before that. We need to generate oracles. Tell me what is correct for something which is not dealing with correctness with health. We need to execute test cases with unpredictable behaviors. We need to deal with unavoidable failures. So you see, we have a completely enormous uh, a set of elements which are completely different from what we've been used users so far you know we've been working for more than half a century on soft on engineering software proper engineering software and we have systems and we know that the system exists that's the other tricky part which is is not just a matter of uh, we want to engineer uh, test cases uh, the systems we can engineer the uh, systems and you know for my little narrow thing if you want i want to actually move to one, something that it's my field which is how Okay, so I want to work on solution results. Solution results in the software testing and analysis research lab, which is one of the chairs of, uh, of, uh, of SAP in uh, computer science and uh, software engineering. And uh, okay, now the technical part. The technical part will be very short because I know that most people, many people will be extremely fascinated by the technical part. Some people are maybe a bit uh, alien from the technical part. I'm sure they come back to me and ask me what we can do with that. But you know, one simple problem, generating test inputs for changing requirements. So you want to generate a test case, you want to say, okay, I, I expect this uh, system to actually sum two integers. So I put take 10 and five and see whether the result is 15, which is my classic testing framework. I want this city to behave well, healthy. What is the input? 
Okay, so the issue is how do we actually generate test inputs for some completely incredibly new environment? Okay, how do we reveal failures? Now, what we do is we need failure prone anomalies. What is that? You don't want to actually see the system failing. You want to predict the system failing. You don't want to actually be stuck in traffic because the smart city risk you up. You want to tell the system, look, you are hitting a very dangerous situation, do something. And now we do that, we use deep learning and the page ranking, you know, technologies which are well known, well studied, and we move on with that. Okay, how do we actually work? We, and this is actually the interdisciplinarity of our approach, which is something that I love from SAT compared to, to, uh, to classic universities. Uh, we got uh, inspiration from physical systems. Not long ago, I was working with a colleague who is a theoretical physicist, and I was fascinated by learning something that I didn't even know anything about. I learned about the work, fantastic work of Ising, a famous scientist who did work of uh, superconductivity and magnetic properties of the system. What is superconductivity and magnetic properties of the system? Basically, what you do is you know that there is a relation between the spin alignment and the magnetic field. Fantastic, and uh, you know, I could enjoy this uh, learning. You know, I'm a professor. I want to learn. I want to learn something new. Uh, oh, then after several months of work, uh, we actually get to the point and say, "Look, <clears throat> we do have a system. We have our smart city. We have KPIs, key performance indicators. We can actually collect mi literally millions of metrics in the system. We can collect the." A CPU occupation of every single CPU in my billion, in, in, in tens of million CPUs in the smart city. We can collect memory occupation. We can collect a, a message passing, message flow. We can collect. We can collect literally tens of millions of uh, of, uh, of of metrics that can be valid or invalid, correct or incorrect. And so we can move from uh, you know particles, our spin. Our spin are a metric is. Uh, a, 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 a normal or anomalous to enormous amount of, uh, of uh, to the big the big matter you know which is the magnetic property of the matter the healthiness of our system and we could actually we've been able to find full prone states looking at anomaly alignments of my kpis and we got actually the best paper award for this at one of the major very prestigious conferences but I'll tell you later more if you really want to stay with our master. Now let me go to the next one, which is, yes, fantastic. We can actually know that the system will fail. Can you tell me whether the system is, the, the behavior is correct or not? Okay. Oh no, we lost the concept of correctness. System is, no, our smart city is not correct. It's not safe. Is it, it can be correct, it can be safe, it can be secure, but we are not caring about a single property and we cannot express that single property. The, uh, the system or the smart city is correct to the extent that it actually works well in, uh, in the system. So it's actually, uh, I need to, to, uh, to get a feeling of the healthiness of the system. It's not just a matter of measuring your temperature. It's not just a matter of measuring your heart rate. You want to get a feeling of the body. Okay, how do we get the feeling of where, uh, what we expect from a system? It's very simple, you know, if you think about when you actually use a system and then let's scale down for a moment, not just a smart city, but maybe also a smart city, but let's say, you know, you get uh, your, your, your new smart car or your new smart device or your new uh, uh, get the right application. Uh, well, you look at the application, you try to use the application, you look at the system, you try to actually get uh, the, uh, the system. And what you actually get is uh, you want to generate oracles from what you know, which is informal, informal elements. So we go from natural language annotations to, to uh, oracles. So natural language annotations are you want to actually get an information on the web and you want to actually transform this information on the web in something that you can check on the system. Now, time to finish. Okay, my chair is actually telling me that I, I should give up in 20 seconds. A uh, couple of information to finish to wrap up. Uh, I wish I could actually have the whole day to tell you about what we do in, in SIT, which is very, very fascinating. But very quickly, uh, uh, this is not me. It's uh, uh, the star team today. It's me, it's my postdoc, it's my is my PhD student is uh, the star team has, has been the last five years. 
it's a many international collaboration that we have. And what we did is we actually want to move from what we do in research, from the application in the society to the master. So as, uh, as Sergey mentioned, we actually create the digital leaders for the future society, which is not just technical training, but is interdisciplinary training. This is not just technical, but is team leadership attitude. It is not like sitting in the class and listening like you do now for me, but it's more like interplay between an academy and industry. You want to talk to people, you want to talk to leaders, and you want not to sit down physically in a class listening, but you want to participate physically or visually. Our environment tomorrow will be trying to be able to show you by practice how you work in a team which is sitting in, in Schaffhausen and Singapore and Pittsburgh uh, and the New York and work together. And uh, I stop here and let uh, the continue with the panel. Thank you very much. So thank you, Mauro. This was a very inspiring uh, presentation. And with these words, I would like to open our um, panel discussion. Uh, in our panel discussion is Mauro, for sure, Sergey, yeah. and it, David. I will actually um, share maybe the information about the master program on the, on the slide so that it will be a background for all yeah, of us. This would be great, uh, Sergey. Um, I would start with a question to Mauro because he's the keynote speaker. Um, so Mauro, I would like to ask you uh, for the relevance and perceptiveness of smart ecosystems and the new emerging needs. And this question is related to the new master program. Yes, thanks for the question. Absolutely. I mean, that's actually a very, very, very important element, you know, and I know I'm passionate because it's my work, but I think, you know, it's really, really important to understand that, you know, it's not like, you know, we are talking about pervasiveness of you know. We've been talking about software pervasiveness in the last uh, 20 years now. I mean, I remember, you know, back in the late 90s in software engineering conferences, software is becoming pervasive. We are talking and then we saw the cell phones. It's not only that. You know, software system world is one single thing. Sooner or later, we will not be able to distinguish what is with or what is not which, or what is actually uh, concrete, what, what is ex equally concrete, but, uh, but digital, okay? And I think, you know, being able to cope with this complexity means being able to cope with our life. So it's not just a matter of moving on and getting yet another market to attack, it is a matter of developing and living in the, new next generation human society which is being completely different for this you need specialists for this you don't need people who actually are good software engineers of course you need them you don't need people who are good makers of course you need them you need people who are actually digital leaders you need people who actually can understand that sergey said at the beginning you know people can understand the uh, tight interplay you know it's not just being able to write software ignoring the people you're not actually being able to understand the people ignoring the software it's not that's a matter of writing your own software ignoring the team everything together and that's what we actually teach in the master and you know i've been teaching 30 years unfortunately already in the university in many different evolving masters and and, and situations and this is for the time, first time we have a chance to see something which is completely new and completely open you know where we mix different and this is basically why why in a Schaffhausen and not in another university because it's Schaffhausen, because it's a new university, it's a new institute, you know. You cannot build a new, yeah, yeah. completely... Uh, 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 Mauro is very passionate, I but I, I, I so just give very... one short comment that basically whatever software you write, whether it's for business project, whether it's just a part of large engineering project, whether it's a science project, it needs to work well. And it doesn't work well unless it has good quality and good quality, unfortunately, the same feature of humans, which makes them able to keep secrets, free will, makes them make mistakes. And as they make mistakes, you have to catch the mistakes and fix them. And that's a science right now in order for this complex software systems to operate. And that is what Mauro was talking about. It's especially important in smart systems because you're talking about uh, billions of lines of code executing in order for the such ecosystems to actually operate. So Sergey, to uh, have, I have one question for you and I, I picked one 
from our audience. Um, there is a question, why SIT in Schaffhausen? There are many competitive universities around, uh, in particular in Switzerland. Why here and why this relatively unsexy name of computer science and engineering? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, this is uh, sort of three questions in one. And I don't think actually any university exists in Schaffhausen. It exists in the universe. And from the standpoint of the universe, uh, Schaffhausen location is inconsequential, uh, whether it's in Schaffhausen or is, uh, in the Alaska uh, or in, in actually uh, Antarctic. Um, and, and it exists in the global environment. We build in the university, which is global. so. Uh, Schaffhausen is just a location which is not far from the airport, which is safe for students and professors, very good living at a very cost effective price. And it's on the border of Germany, so you can choose to live in European Union or in Switzerland. It's actually an amazing location um, for a university which is targeting uh, the, at least this earth, not specifically Switzerland. In terms of competition, uh, yes, there are some very nice uh, competitors, but they are not the same as us. We are focused on different things, which is much described on the slide with this program. It's on leadership. Um, that's not the focus when you are a large institution, like a wonderful institution like ETH, you have to also focus on the broad computer engineers. If you only educate leaders, you cannot actually um, uh, develop anything just with leaders. Uh, we have all these differentiators, which are very special for the leaders and for the future, which we believe, again, it's a focus area. Uh, the name, uh, for me, it's very sexy. Master uh, in Computer Science and Software Engineering. Uh, it's a most sexy name. I'm PhD in Computer Science and Software Engineering, so nothing is more sexy than my PhD for me. I, I don't know <laughs> why people think that some other names are uh, more sexy. It exactly describes what we want to do. We want to build world-class computers and world-class software to solve world problems. Um, you know, Arthur, in uh, our press conference, um, uh, Arthur Eckert subtly said that some of those problems are solved in computers. Actually, none of the modern problems are solved without computers. So you have to use computers for everything, even for this press conference. So I think it's an amazing name, and it's an amazing place, and it's a clear differentiator. Thank you, Sergei. Uh, with these words, I would like to invite David. David is the Dean uh, of School of Computing in Singapore. National University of Singapore is one of the best universities in the world. And David, you are quite ahead of the times in digital and software related topics. So, so what do you think about this multidisciplinarity in uh, SIT with uh, physics, computer science and uh, business science? This is a good uh, development for the future. Um, skills, I would say, skills for students. Yes, I would. I would definitely agree. Uh, the, you know, the the multidisciplinary mix of this program, I would think, should be very appealing to students. Um, you know, as Mauro and Sergey both have said in the in the remarks that they've made, computing is at the center of everything that people do now. It's it's a you know it's a a key. Um, a key driver of every scholarly discipline. It's a, uh, you know, a very important fundamental uh, component of every sector of industry. And um, it's basically influencing everything that is being done in the world now. And students in a, in a modern computing course need to develop a level of comfort and expertise with solving problems that arise from a, from a mix of disciplines and they need to have the comfort to work in teams um, that, uh, that involve a, a multidisciplinary mix of people. They need to be, be able to have the ability to attack problems that have, um, that, that have uh, elements not just of computer science but of some specific application domain that they might have to uh, apply their skills in. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so Mauro, back to you. Um, so uh, one, one practical thing to this master program, this is two years program, are the scholarships available? What are the costs um, if you start this program for students? 
Okay, yes, it's a two years program. It's actually a, in line with the new idea. It's a flexible program. So it's a, a classic two years program. If you are really, really good, you can squeeze your master thesis in the summer and complete in one and a half year, and we call it fast track. You can also uh, take a, an international experience and spend one year at NUS or a CMU. We know that the, the, uh, the master is expensive. It's expensive, the master is expensive to go to CMU. It's expensive to go to uh, NUS. So we do have availability for scholarships for the residential master in Schaffhausen for the uh, my joint program, not for all students, for the best students. So if you are a good student and you actually want to bet on yourself, you can really come and get, for uh, example, spend, you know, get full coverage, full cost coverage, both uh, fees and scholarship for, uh, for the SAT and the dual degree with uh, 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 NUS or uh, CMU. Okay, Sergei, I would like to hear from you one statement. You as a founder and initiator of SIT, and in a way you are the father uh, of this um, SIT master. Uh, perhaps I prefer to be a mother. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, please Go a on. statement from your side, um, because we have another three minutes from everybody. I need one statement to this master program. Why students should come to Schaffhausen uh, well, I think uh, we are focused uh, today on three, uh, on the five professions. I think if you are a very technical person, you definitely need to hear what we have to say about chief architect, chief program officer, or chief security officer. There are very unique ways to approach those things in the case of large-scale software projects. Nobody teaches you how to build modern large-scale software projects. Suddenly, every project is large-scale. If you are actually a person who is interested to be a business leader or a team leader, uh, you would be very interested in our unique uh, differentiators for chief development officer and chief product officer because, again, you're no longer dealing with a piece of software. You're dealing with large software products sold to thousands, tens of thousands, millions, hundreds of millions of billions of people. Um, and you're talking about managing a team of thousands of very advanced people to build those products. And that is something which, again, is not taught, believe me, um, in any university today. And that is our value add. That's what we know how to do. And that's what we will teach you. Okay, David, you cannot do advertisement, I think so. But um, maybe you have some final words from your side, from your view. Well, I can't do advertisement, but I can at least uh, congratulate Sergey and Mauro on the launch of this program. It, uh, to me, it's a very appealing program that uh, will ground students in uh, you know, subject areas that are very important for the future of technology development, a very, a very exciting future, um, as outlined by Sergey and Mauro. And, um, you know, again, congratulations. Uh, and uh, it's very nice to see this being offered by a university of the future as well. well thank you. Then the final words are up to Mauro because you are the academic director. You are not the mother, you are maybe the father then of this program. <laughs> uh, let me say Great a bit of the program. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, for, for concluding, uh, we have said several things. I think uh, the unique, uh, most important characteristics, uh, you will be working in a completely new, agile, international environment, uh, young environment, uh, which is growing with you. So I think, you know, the really, really great thing is uh, go to a well-established university and you actually have to adjust to the structure come to SAT and you, have, you can build the structure around you. That's actually, I think, uh, the, uh, the, the big challenge that teaches you how to be a leader in the future. So thank you very much from my side to this panel and panelists, and I bridge to Mark. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Jürgen, thanks a lot. Thanks thank for you. enlightening us, all of you, on this wonderful new course, which, of course, is the the centerpiece of today's virtual nano conference. Just a little bit of housekeeping. We do have this wonderful Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Press it, ask, a, ask us a question, because at the end of the conference, the last 15 minutes, roughly 12.15 to 12.25, we're going to have an answer session of those questions with 
Dr. Bella Ossoff and with Professor Pese as well, and with uh, another one of our panelists, Vasily Zorin, who is at the University of California in Santa Barbara. So keep firing those questions on that uh, Q&A function and we'll make sure we answer them as well. So that was the future of computing component of today's virtual data conference. We're now gonna move on to quantum information. So this is the three section event, computing, quantum, and cyber security. So without further ado, and thank you by the way, thank you all for joining us today. We've got many, many hundreds from around the world. We're so thankful you're joining us today for this wonderful launch of this new MST program in, as Dr. Bella Usov says, sexy computer science and software engineering. You've heard from the father, you've heard from the mother. Let's talk about uh, our third keynote today, the future of quantum information, which is gonna be delivered by the University of Oxford Professor Arthur Eckert. And after Professor Eckert speaks, I'm gonna hand it over to the moderator of the next panel, who's the Science and Technology Project Officer at SIT, Flavia Tomakia. Professor Eckert, I'm gonna hand it over to your capable hands. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it is a great pleasure to share my personal vision for, um, I guess, for the future of quantum technologies. And uh, let me just make sure whether the classical technology works. So let's see whether I can change this um, slide to the next one. Uh, if, you, if you could, please. Right, so, so the, um, to start with, you know, if we, if we, I'd like to put the whole field in a slightly broader perspective. So if you think about quantum technology, it's just you should think about um, the human exploration, the human uh, way of uh, domesticating nature, trying to understand it, trying to um, make uh, sense how the laws of nature uh, work, and then trying to control it and to use it to our advantage. And um, so if in, in this sort of quest for uh, knowing and then domesticating and then uh, making it useful, no matter what we do today, it's, it's quite clear that you have to um, heat the, the, the quantum and the quantum is, is in the future. It's where a lot of um, knowledge, technological knowledge lies. So it's only started sort of scratching the surface of this new area. So on this slide, you can see as we're progressing from, uh, from mechanical devices, we are going to, we understand the world of atoms and molecules better and better. But it's only, as I said, it's, it's only the very beginning to understanding the whole complexity of the quantum world. So if, uh, if we can just move to the next slide, please. Um, so it's, it's, it's already quite clear that uh, knowing quantum and knowing how atoms and electrons behave created lots of knowledge, lots of entry. The um, uh, fact that we are having this teleconference is to a large extent because of the what we call the first quantum revolution where people learn how to um, use uh, Computer, how to sort of unlock power of uh, electrons and use some quantum phenomena. But as I said, um, there is a lot to come. And I think uh, at this time, we, we, period of time, we realize that there are some quantum phenomena we haven't quite yet touched. And, and I will say a few words later on about uh, quantum interference and perhaps quantum entanglement. But basically, um, if uh, what we know today that if we are able to and and, and we are pretty sure we are able to uh, tap into this uh, degree of uh, progress in technology to control uh, quantum phenomena with enough precision we will be able to capitalize in um, in many areas and when we bring information technology to this the impact of this second quantum revolution the probably the most profound impact will be in the area of privacy um, in the area of uh, precision, super precise uh, atomic clocks, frequency standards, uh, better sensors, 
Um, but uh, today I just only, and you know, you can talk about the privacy, you can talk about the precision, you can give a lecture on every single aspect of um, quantum technology and impact on information technology. But today I'll just only say a few words about quantum computers. So that is how how those uh, new quantum phenomena will impact uh, quantum computing devices, quantum simulators, uh, and why we should be excited about it. Why is it such a big deal? So we can go, move to the next slide, please. So if you, um, in, in a sense with quantum computers, we have to start from scratch. We have to go back to the drawing board. And when you do this, you realize that uh, computer science or the basic of computer science is so much entangled with physics that if you were to walk into a lab where people were playing with the first computers back in 1940s, for example, you wouldn't be able to tell a difference whether this is actually about computing or is about a sophisticated physics experiment. And that's exactly what is the case today. When we talk about quantum computers, um, those are devices that uh, are at the stage where we try to, you wouldn't be actually, those are very complicated physics experiments at the moment. So what you see on the left is a Manchester University lab from the 40s, and it's one of the first early classical computers. And what you see on the right on this slide is a picture from Center for Quantum Technologies in Singapore. And I guess it wasn't Dmitry Matsukevich lab where we are actually like building the new generation of quantum computers. So as you can see, even visually, physics and computer science meet at some basic and profound level because information is physical. And that's one of the mantra, one of the takeaway points for all of you who, who, who um, are listening to this talk, that information is physical and information processing is a physical process. And therefore, you have to understand physics if you want to make a fundamental progress in computer science. So we can move to the next slide, please. Well, you can, so here's an example of, uh, of um, uh, again, uh, a Google quantum computer that hit the headlines. So I'm just showing this that, you know, if you look at visually, you wouldn't be able to say, well, what are you really looking at? Are you looking at some piece of electronics, a, a physics lab, or is it, how would you know it's a new generation of, uh, of a computing device? But you would certainly know that there's something sophisticated going on there, trying to control nature at the most precise level. So let me go for the light, please. Then um, there are many ways to introduce the concept of quantum computing. An obvious question people ask is what exactly it is. This it's when you start talking about the second quantum revolution. What is it that that makes uh, it so different? Um, is it because uh, things are smaller and therefore we can compute faster? Is it just about technology per se or is there some kind of interesting new thing that, uh, that is lurking somewhere there and we want to tap into this? It's, it's the latter. So the one thing, um, you know, one way to say and to explain this perhaps without going to complicated equations is to say that there is a quantum phenomenon that we try to um, grasp with and, and, uh, and tame it. It's called quantum interference. And essentially, it is about a very puzzling set of experiments that physicists have been trying to understand for a long period of time. And here I just have a very basic um, graphical representation of such an experiment. It's where you basically send the light into a, um, a semi-transparent mirror called the beam splitter and uh, the light can propagate to another beam splitter taking um, you may say one of the two possible paths and then end up in a photo detector behind the second beam splitter. It turns out that the thinking that goes, the classical luggage, you know, that we have thinking about it in terms of, oh, it takes one of the two paths, it doesn't actually quite work. Physicists did this experiment zillions of times and it turns out that the only reasonable explanation for this experiment, however unlikely it is, is that the photon and the light takes actually both paths at the, at the same time or somehow 
both of those that have to be explored by a single photon on its way from the input on the left hand side to the output which is one of the detectors on the right hand side so you know if you find it surprising you're not the only one can we just move on with the slides please it's, it, is, it is true that, you know, the quantum world is very different and it's very puzzling in this respect that the fact that the single uh, object can explore uh, different trajectories, different path, and then the produce the result that is the, um, the somehow depends on all those path. So can we move on, please? Slides, please. And, uh, and some, you know, that in the popular culture, this has been explored by, um, by the phrase of quantum superpositions and the Pula Erwin Schrodinger, who's been um, one of the fathers of uh, quantum uh, theory. Uh, and he's Pula Kett that is also present, quite often presented as, as uh, being in two states, dead and alive. And somehow, you know, um, shows how how puzzling it was for many people the fact that you that the quantum objects can explore uh, different possibilities uh, somehow simultaneously if we can move to the next slide please so then let's apply the concept to computation so this is a very very simplistic graphical representation of a computation where you think about a physical machine that has a number of configurations and my dots here, vertical dots, represent different configurations of this machine. On the horizontal axis we have uh, time or computational steps and a typical computer, classical computer, will move in one computational step from one configuration to another and yet to another and yet to another and it will end up uh, in some in output configuration which represents a solution to your problem. Can we move to another slide, please? Then the probabilistic computers uh, that, uh, that we've, you know, we, we, we use a randomized algorithm uh, where we explore a little bit uh, differently this configuration of, of different configurations of your computing machine. Uh, it turns out that it, it is sometimes useful to let computer choose randomly which configuration is going to go next. And we have a situation where we rely on probability and randomness to enhance our computation, surprisingly. But, um, but it is certainly the fact that in every single run of your computer, one of many possible paths, I have only two here, is, uh, is, is really taken. We can can take the next slide, please. So what, but in, in contrast in quantum computation, what uh, we can say is like in those simple experiments with photons, um, a computing device actually takes all possible paths and produces the result that depends on contributions from all those possible paths. And that's like a massive quantum interference within one piece of hardware. If we can go to the next slide, please. So then you may say, so what? But the computer scientists realize that if you do uh, quantum computation using this phenomenon of quantum interference, then you can actually construct new, inherently new algorithms because quantum physics allows you to uh, set up uh, or construct instructions of, of programming languages that do not have a counterpart. So you, out of the sudden, the set of instruction for your programming is much larger than it is for classical computers. And this diagram here shows um, the advantage of quantum computing. And uh, what it really represents without going into technical details is that computer scientists like to think about complexity of the problem, so asking you know, how difficult a given problem is. And they measure it in terms of the scaling that means how much more energy, how much more time, how much memory I need if I increase the size of the input. And uh, if, for example, execution time grows as any polynomial function of the size of the input, that's okay. If it's exponential, it's too hard. Can we move to the next slide, please? And then perhaps the next one. 
So, so the, th the thing is that what quantum computers can do, they can actually, by the set of instructions, make some difficult problems uh, easy. So, so, so this, those complexity classes that I showed on the previous diagram are different for quantum computers and for classical computers. And all, all that means is that it's not only by the virtue of technology, but by the virtue of technology giving us ability to program in a different way. We can come up with algorithms that do not have classical counterpart and those algorithms are also um, able to solve certain difficult problems that we cannot solve with classical technology. Now on this slide, we just I try to illustrate why it is so difficult to build a quantum computer. Basically the reason for that is that uh, it's, uh, it's um, that those quantum superpositions or those abilities for a quantum system to explore different paths, different possibilities are done by a phenomenon that is called coherence. It just simply means that the, it's very difficult to confine computation to the piece of hardware that, uh, that you have. Computation simply spills out in an uncontrolled way to the environment and uh, very little of that then is left so, so in, in your device. Um, that can be helped with isolation, that can be helped with error correcting codes, but it's a serious challenge. Uh, it's one of the reasons you don't see that often quantum phenomena. You see consequences of, you can see the, the consequences of quantum phenomena all around you, but you don't necessarily see quantum inter interference as, as we produce in the labs in very special environments. Can we move on to the next one? So building a quantum computer is, is, is therefore a big challenge and building one can be compared perhaps to the progress in building complex buildings in the history of civil engineering and architecture. So if you, if you look, for example, at the Greek temple, it's a, it's a beautiful building, right? We all agree that it's, it's fantastic. It has nice proportions. It was, there's a sense of elegance and sense of beauty there. But uh, the ancient Greeks from the from, from the civil engineering point of view, we're rather lousy constructors. You know, this building is, uh, you have to, to support the roof of this Greek temple. You will have to basically create a forest of pillars and columns and, and uh, otherwise it would just simply collapse. It's simply because the, the Greeks didn't have the concept of an arch that only Etruscans and then, and then Romans had. So think about building computer as going from a very sort of rudimentary step. Can we move to the next slide, please? Um, which is basically like having a set of bricks, set of your basic blocks. And first you start building walls. And, uh, you know, however beautiful those experiments might be, they are still not as good as getting to the point where you build a very, when you build an arch. But to build an arch is, is something that requires a little bit of an effort because you have to bend those bricks and, and there's this keystone that you have to put at some point at the top of the arch. And before you reach that, if you don't do it very carefully and you don't have precise materials, the whole thing will collapse. So building you know, an arch requires uh, lots of precision, lots of sort of uh, engineering. And, uh, but once you have it, then you can actually start scaling those things up because arches can, can and can create ceilings that can support huge areas of space. So, so that's what we want to do in quantum computing. Things about bricks as quantum logic gates, a very simple circuit that we achieve today are those like walls. We still are looking for stable and fault tolerant constructions, which we don't have today, but hopefully we will, and then scaling up will eventually happen, but there's a long way to go. Um, can we have the next slide, please? And we can perhaps keep to the next one. And maybe next one, because uh, whenever I ask about predictions, you know, so, so I think that um, putting this in the context of this meeting and this conference, it is my understanding and my belief that the Schaffhausen Institute would like to, um, would like to contribute to this quest of uh, building and domesticating, and not only building a computer per se, but domesticating quantum technology, making it useful, turning it into something, uh, turning all those wacky ideas and, and equations that we academics love so much into, into products, into something useful, into something that um, uh, can serve 
people at large. But it's, it is a complicated path. Even if we have a better understanding, it's not so easy to turn some of those ideas into something because it requires a little bit of a different thinking, thinking both as a mathematicians, both as a computer scientist and physicist. And to illustrate this, so can we go to the next slide, please? And next slide, please. And to illustrate this, I, I always like to give this puzzle that I quite often give to, to my uh, students and my colleagues. Um, and the puzzle is, is, is quite, um, quite interesting because it shows how you think. Uh, if you find this puzzle difficult, then you're probably a mathematician, someone who likes to think in very abstract terms, in, in, in conceptual terms. But if you find it easy, then probably you are more like an engineer, someone who thinks in a very practical way. Um, so the puzzle is, uh, goes like this, um, you know, the, here are you, the man in front of two rooms. Uh, there are two rooms and in one room you have uh, three um, light bulbs which are connected and there's one co one to one connection between those light bulbs into the um, electrical switches which are in the other room, all initially in position off. Now your task is to find out what is one-to-one -one connection between the switches and the light bulbs, but you are allowed to go to each room only once. So once you're in the room, you can do whatever you want, but once you leave the room, you're not allowed to enter the same room again. So when you give this puzzle to a mathematician or a logician or someone who thinks in abstract terms, the person would say, well, you know, you cannot do it simply because uh, you don't have enough information. Um, if you, it only makes sense to go to the room with the switches first and you go there and uh, you know, say you put one switch in position on, you go to the other room and you see one light bulb that is on and there's ambiguity about the two that are off. And you just uh, explore all combinations and can conclude that no matter what you do in the first room, you will never have enough information when you go to the second room and look at the light bulb simply because there will be always ambiguity about the two that will be either on or off. So you conclude and you can say, I can prove I cannot do it, right? So it's, it's impossible. But give it to an engineer and the engineer say, well, it's actually very simple. What do you do? You just go to the first room, uh, take the first switch, put it in position on, uh, go to the second switch, put it in position on, say for five minutes or so, then leave the room, switching this off, so you just switch off, put the second switch on for five minutes, switch it off, go to another room, and you can see that one light bulb is on, another one is still warm when you touch it, and the other one is off. So clearly, if you explore this for real, if you think in practical terms, if you use all physics involved, including, including the heat dissipation, you can solve this. But you see, it requires a certain mental switch from thinking in terms of mathematical models to practicalities. And uh, can we move to the next slide, please? <clears throat> and I think that it is actually um, important to have institutions which can teach people um, or encourage people to think in a way that bridges those two different um, attitudes and points of view. So I, I do hope that um, in this quest for the, the, the quest for quantum technology will be just uh, one way of teaching students to think differently, to think in a way that can bridge both abstract conceptual thinking with more practical and more industry oriented thinking. So I guess that will probably conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur, for this inspiring talk. So I would like to introduce the other panelists for today. So we have as well Professor Meta Tature from the University of Cambridge. is an expert in quantum optics. And Dr. Carmen Palacios, she is CEO and co-founder of New Quantum, a spin-out company from the University of Cambridge. I would like to start the discussion by asking a question to all of you which in your view defines what the quantum era is? So which are the main advantages that nowadays quantum can actually bring to the society? Artur, do you want to start, please? Um, so can you just please, uh, if you, Flavia, if you can repeat the question. Um... Sure. So we are talking about the quantum era. So 
I would like to know from you what defines this quantum era and which were the main advantages that quantum could bring to the society. Yes, yeah, so um, it's again, you know, it's very difficult to say a given era starts at a given point, you know, nobody knows, even our colleague historians cannot tell us when the steam engine era really started or when Renaissance started. It's just at some point we acquire ability to do more than, than uh, our colleagues in the past. And I think that the quantum era just as a the way I see it, it certainly you know, the birth of quantum physics at the, in the, at the beginning of the 20th century was, um, was the first sort of intellectual effort to understand this. But somehow it would be not possible with the current advances in quantum technology where we for the first time started experimenting with individual atoms and individual photons. So if you look at the, say, Nobel Prizes that went to amazing physical experiments in the last um, uh, 10 years or so. So you will look at people working with trap ions, people working with individual atoms, um, could actually explore our physics not as a collection of zillions and zillions and zillions of things, but, but atom by atom, photon by photon. And, and that pushed our ability to both understanding this and also experimenting with this. So I think that, you know, quantum era is, is what, it def what defines it, it defines our ability to control the quantum phenomena, which I think we are, we are, we are getting there. So I think we are really in the early stage of the second quantum era. Yeah, thank you very much. It's really inspiring. Uh, Mette, I would like to then connect to this saying, which is uh, nowadays stopping quantum computers and quantum itself to go to the next level and which would be the timeline, for example, for implementing quantum devices at this stage? Um, I think one, one element of, of quantum computing that I particularly find exciting is that when we say information is physical, we, we actually mean it in this context. Uh, when we define a zero and one that's relevant for quantum computing or, or various other quantum technologies that benefit from this, this superposition that Arthur uh, uh, nicely talked about, um, we, we don't actually, we need to uh, anchor it down to a physical system. So typically, hardware is crucial in, in quantum computing. So in that sense, uh, perhaps unlike the conventional uh, uh, computing approach, that the software can remain detached from hardware, we don't have that in, in, in quantum computing at the moment. So that means for every physical system, you almost develop the corresponding uh, software or algorithms that, that provide you with a certain uh, advantage or, or, or capability. So from that perspective, what excites me most uh, in, in this uh, area is the fact that we have multiple hardware realizations uh, all going forward with, with uh, you know, varying progress. Uh, and they all come with their own challenges. But this doesn't mean that there is one winning uh, system, uh, like in the conventional case, for example, the silicon uh, dominance that we have had for uh, conventional computing. We actually have in, in the quantum era, uh, we have multiple platforms available for us, uh, ranging from atoms uh, all the way to uh, solid state systems and even just the photons themselves, uh, following again uh, Arthur's example. So, uh, they all come with their own challenges of how to do this interfacing. And I think the common problem for, uh, for all, a challenge, I should say, for all quantum computing approaches so far is scalability. And that is, uh, as again, nicely uh, uh, touched upon, how to go from bricks to the, 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 the gate and then the, the wall and the structure in the most feasible way, in a way that we actually don't know at the moment necessarily. We don't actually have uh, the, uh, the vision of the whole landscape on how to build the most optimal uh, configuration. So this is the next challenge. I wouldn't say anything is stopping quantum computing, it's going full force uh, you know, forward, uh, but the challenges are even identifying the right approaches to the systems engineering aspect within the quantum world, be my answer, I guess. Thank you, Mete. So uh, talking still about application, I will have to move to Carmen. We have an example of someone that actually managed to put their PhD research into applications so of founding a company, New Quantum, that's really working on this technology. So Carmen, I would like to know from you your experience as a young entrepreneur actually managing this, this step and also putting this technology a step forward to, to real application. Thanks, Flavia, and uh, thanks, uh, Zeti, for the invitation. Um, 
my experience in taking uh, in doing tech transfer, um, I think now is a really exciting time to do it in in quantum. But you need to. It's almost like you need to stay a few years ahead. So at New Quantum, what we're commercializing is single photon components, uh, devices that can emit single photons and measure single photons that can then go in, in different systems, whether that be computation, uh, sensing, uh, communication. Um, and a few years ago, even now, it seemed strange that that would be a focus of Tech, tech transfer that that you know at the moment no one no one really buys a single photon source you don't you can't really uh, imagine what that product looks like and it's a it's a process of every all the time constantly you need to just um, forget about what quantum physics was in the lab and was uh, doing research and just think about what what it necessarily will be uh, or what, what will be needed, right? So the question about what's stopping at the moment certain applications from going forwards, um, they, there's, there's many things and it's all going forward really fast. There's, there's certain limitations at the moment. We focus on, on the single photon component, so of what we see as the quantum essence of these systems uh, and, and bringing attention to, to being able to create and handle uh, what is the essential resource of the system, the single photons, uh, with high efficiency, high rate. Yeah, I would like also for you to stress a bit the, let's say, the, the part of being entrepreneur, because it's not really easy at this stage to actually move forward this technology. So we have students also in our audience, so it would be kind of inspiring for them to understand slightly a bit more, I mean, okay. the process yeah, itself, sure. the challenges. Sure, so I mean, coming from a quantum optics PhD uh, where I was largely um, almost alone in a lab for many years, now it's totally different. Now I spend all my time talking to people, uh, getting people on board, excited about this idea, you know, getting money, getting projects, getting partners. So in that sense, it's a real, it's a real switch. I think at some point you just need to to see if you find if you find it more exciting to try and really uh, get something to work from an, from an engineering point of view that is that is useful, and this is not um, this is not publishing a paper that you know works a few times. This is something that needs to work every time consistently across millions of devices. So it's a completely different challenge. So it's whether you at first find find it interesting to do that. So to just to move more to an engineering uh, kind of situation. And if you find it exciting to, to you know, zoom out from your PhD or undergraduate research and just like look at the whole world, at the whole field, at everyone that's working on this and, and see what's moving, what's, what's, what's needed, what, would be, what, what, what are the problems that need to be solved, uh, you know, what are the what are the thoughts that people are having that are new that are different um, um, and then I guess so at the University of Cambridge um, I, I had a lot of help actually there's uh, you know there's the tech transfer team that managed RIP at Cambridge Enterprise there's a couple of sort of entrepreneurship uh, workshops and things like this that kind of you know we, we had a patent Mete and I filed a patent on the invention and so you know, everyone was very excited to see how, what that would look like, what that commercialization would look like, and what started being a con kind of like a theoretical exercise on entrepreneurship, you know, yeah. commercializing single open sources, turned out to be something that really uh, attracted me and attracted other people. And so I'd say the main challenges uh, are to switch your mentality to something that is actually completely different, um, building a team, that can do that, that can, you know, that is, you know, not, not only people that have studied quantum optics, but people yeah. that are software engineers, electronics engineers, uh, product managers. Um, and then, I mean, and then being creative and, and really, uh, and, and you need resource, right? You need, you need money. It's a relatively good time, uh, despite Corona, to get money for quantum technologies because they're exciting, but but it's still a challenge, not, not a romantic. So I guess those, that would be my, 
my take on Thank you. Thank you. It's really, it's really interesting. So this uh, reminds me, uh, you talk about that you need to have different figures to actually push forward the technology and everything. So question for Meta and also for Arthur as well. Um, which would it be then the main changes that you need to implement in teaching research to actually push through the inter interdisciplinary approach, so actually to create that ecosystem that's needed in real application, not only being really focused on your own uh, line of research? Please, Mede, start. Who's, who's uh, leading? Arthur, you want to take this or shall I? Who is more inspired by the question? Okay, um, but, uh, I will let you answer all this. Sure, okay. Um, I, I think we'll all be on the same, same page anyways. I think I'll be just saying what's on everyone's minds. Um, the formal structure, the, 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 the old school approach of physics, chemistry, maths, material science, computer science, all these being in separate parts of the campus, not really interacting with each other, is no longer going to work if you want to bring particularly something like the, the quantum era uh, into, uh, into play. So as, as we just talked about how hardware and software have to be interlinked in a way that we don't actually know how it's going to be the most optimal way and that research has to happen and it is happening around the world. Um, the places that shine at the moment uh, happen to put together those different aspects or locations on campus into a single uh, uh, virtual uh, interacting uh, arrangement. So uh, interdisciplinarity is not just a, a pleasant word to use uh, in this context, but it's actually absolutely necessary that physicists need to understand, physicists who work on quantum physics need to understand elements of quantum, uh, elements of computing science. Um, computer scientists need to understand what quantum can bring and how it's going to be different. There is this uh, language of quantum computing being a bit better than classical computing. It's not necessarily a race, it's a whole change of uh, the way we do things if, if it's going to uh, come to life. So, we need to build that together so we can only do it not by uh, like a, a produ production line of physicists coming out with ideas, passing on to engineers, engineers develop something, pass it on to uh, uh, software engineers to write the code to run the system. That linear uh, progression is just not possible with quantum technologies. So we have to bring it all together. Flavia, fantastic panel. Thank you very much for moderating that and thank you all panelists as well. I'll just to remove my, my glasses. Thanks all, by the way, for being here. This has been an absolutely compelling virtual nano conference. Please stick around. We've got a lot more to come, such as our next speaker, who is the former CIA chief polygraph examiner and interrogator, Dr. Barry L. McManus. Before I introduce Dr. McManus, I want to tell you about the moderator of the panel, after Dr. McManus speaks, moderating the panel, we'll have a member of the board at SIT, Christian Whip. Very quickly, before I introduce Dr. McManus, please hit that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. That's the way you can ask questions to us. We'll have a panel after the next, uh, a Q&A panel, after we finish the next panel, whereby we'll be asking all your questions on this big, big day today, this big launch of this MSc in computer science and software engineering at SIT. So please do continue to fire questions. You've thrown lots of questions at us already, which we're answering, but we will answer them in person at the end. So do stick around for that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. McManus, who's going to be sharing his world-class expertise on finding criminals and detecting lies in his keynote session today entitled Extended Version of Cyber Security Concepts. And Dr. McManus has been up, I think, since 2 or 3 a.m. So I bow down to you, Dr. McManus. As a journalist, I know what it's like to get up at 2 a.m. for five years. I'll hand it over to you. Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, Mark, uh, for this introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my theme or my agenda this morning for the next uh, 15 minutes or so is to have a conversation of, about human aspects in, in cybersecurity. And it seems like, unfortunately, you know, in my field, it's always bad news, and it always comes at the end. Um, the importance, in my opinion, of having a, a cyber workforce that is not only technically strong in understanding uh, computer science and software engineering, but also understand the importance of human behavior. 
of people behind the science. And first to be clear, unlike other distinguished guests here this morning that I've listened to since 2 a.m. my time in, in the U.S. Uh, this morning, is not that first, that I'm not a scientist or a, a, a full-time researcher. I am a practitioner and to become, a, become more specific, a human collector a person who works uh, with people to collect information. And how do we prepare and protect ourselves offensively and defensively against hackers or what I call bad actors? And I also call it the forgotten conversation because this is generally the last thing that most people wanna talk about. Um, I, I unfortunately will bring bad news because my job has been in the past is finding those bad bad people, but I also think it's significant for those who are in the field of, of, of cyber, uh, whether it is uh, as an engineer or computer scientist, to understand the human aspects of it. But what I would like to do first is to make clear of what I refer to as a hacker and also what I refer to as a cracker a, for the audience. Well, in my opinion, a hacker is a person who is interested in working on or operating systems in depth. And generally, hackers are programmers. Uh, they have good and advanced knowledge on the operating systems, um, programming languages, and networking concepts. They are capable of identifying the risk of the system, and a hacker tries to gain further knowledge in discovering technological areas. Um, the cracker, on the other hand, is what I call that bad actor. That bad actor in which a hacker becomes is someone or a person who violates those basic principles, the system's inter integrity and uh, remote machinery with malicious intent. He or she gets unauthorized access to a system and resources and data. Uh, crackers also destroy vital information of the organization. He or she denies legitimate user service and causes problems uh, for the for the uh, for the targets. This area can result in software and hardware network issues. So now that we get that understanding, what do we do? How do we prepare and protect ourselves offensively and defensively against these hackers uh, or bad actors? Next slide, please. I, I'd like to talk a little bit about identifying some of the profiles of these bad actors. And these are going to be in generalities that I will speak of. A psychological profile is what I'm going to address. And I'll try to give maybe one or two examples of what I mean about, about this. And also for the audience, realize I'm talking about those bad actors, those crackers, doing things intentionally to destroy a system or a program. First, hackers basically can fall into a couple of broad categories, and that's what I'm going to speak of, broad categories, the good and the bad. The topic of hacker, hackers is very broad. Um, I will focus and highlight what we know and some of the gaps. I will provide an overview of their psychological and personality profiles, keeping in mind that no one size fits all, and people are individuals and are different meaning that stereotypes do exist and we need to be aware of what those stereotypes are to avoid missing an opportunity to identify those seeking to cause us harm. For example, a stereotype may be that uh, hackers being all males and are only coming from a certain area or a certain region or a certain country uh, with the majority may be, may be males, but females are also bad actors. They're also hackers and may reside anywhere in the world and be of any age. So what and who are these individuals? And I sort of gave an overview and it'll be a very quick profile of what some of these bad actors could, could look like. And I, I speak of the idea of obviously very bright, of high intelligence, methodical in their actions, although they can not necessarily care about things in such that they're oblivious to things that uh, may not be of interest to them. They're curious and independent. Arrogance also plays a role, the desire to show off one's computer skills. I'd like to give you a, a, world, a real world life um, idea. Um, someone that wasn't a, a, a hacker or a cracker, but someone that was also of high intelligence, very methodical, very curious, and very independent. And this was a nuclear scientist, also a very scientific person, 
And having all of these major attributes, uh, there was something else that he had very strong. It was very able to overcome um, being caught in his bad act, his bad actions. The thing that this individual did and what we are trying to do and what I want you to understand as engineers and, and, and programmers is that understanding people's behaviors will, will, will sometimes defeat their actions. And what I mean by that, this individual was able to not only defeat the system around him, but he was able, and he was able to do this because he understood the culture of the people that he was trying to circumvent, trying to get around. He, understand, he understood their traditions, he understood their values, he understood their mores, he understood particular things about them and his ability to communicate that and get people to buy into him was his success. So the important, the important things here is for, once we get over what we're trying to build, is also that people will try to destroy those things. They will try to capture those things. They will try to penetrate these things. And these are things that you must understand as someone in this field to be able to, to let's say, identify. Next slide, please. In addition, some of the basic psychological profile of bad actors, again, people who do target you and uh, your company or your, your agency or, or your government, is that a lot of these hackers or crackers really start at a very early age. Um, some say as early as the age of 12. Uh, my experience has been more around the ages of 17, where they become very curious and start uh, browsing into chat rooms and see how things work. A lot of times they're socially uh, different. They're loners, they're by themselves, which is not unusual. Uh, they may not be socially popular. Um, one of the things that in studies that I have been, been a participant in is that some of them often, they often uh, have not a lot of sexual, inex they're sexually inexperienced related to their peers. So they're sort of isolated. So personality wise, psychologically wise, how can they be accepted into what they consider their normal society? Next slide, please. Um, hackers, crackers, spies, and thieves. I call these industrial spies and thieves uh, that may use some of the same techniques and tools uh, to explore or to uh, uh, crack into a system. Um, their motivations may be somewhat of the same, which is, again, something else that mon one must think about, is what motivates someone to do this. Um, I think this has become very important as far as understanding human dynamics. Sometimes the motivations are somewhat similar to any other hacker or cracker, that is doing something to gain an advantage, sometimes for revenge, where they steal or, or try to steal something of confidential information. They also may feel um, unvalued, uh, not a valuable person within the company, within the, the, within the organization they work, and even sometimes socially, they feel isolated. They feel uh, a, a sense of not being valued. So they act out. And they act out in a way sometimes by having access or penetrating an organization, looking for weaknesses, flaws, and vulnerabilities. And I'm not talking about the software. I'm not talking about breaking into a system. I'm talking about the individual. I'm talking about the person. I'm talking about seeking that individual they feel that has a flaw, that has a vulnerability, that, that has a weakness that in turn that they can use to their benefit. Next slide, please. Um, I, I like to address um, um, uh, types of hackers or bad actors. And there are many more than the four that I have here, but these are four that I thought would sort of resonate with, with the audience and, and to understand exactly what we're trying to capture here. And in these four categories, I'll try to get a little more in depth, a little bit about what this means. Um, types of crackers or hackers or, or bad actors that I call them is always the criminal type. And this is someone that you may think, well, why would someone do this? What would be the advantage of me being an act, a bad actor or a cracker to evade or, or penetrate someone's system. You may say, well, a criminal normally is, is for financial gain, but you also have those criminal psychopaths, those individuals that, um, I don't know, they, they take pleasure in creating havoc and they are sensation seekers, they're opportunists. 
Um, there's a, a, a book that, that is very famous. It's, it's quite old. It goes back to, I think, 2006 by an author named Robert Hare. It's called Snakes in Suits. And the whole concept of this book was to look at psychopaths who invade Wall Street. Those individuals that come from some of the best schools, some of the, they're some of the brightest, they're, they're, they're highly intellectual, um, all of those things that I mentioned in a couple of slides ago, however, they have an evil side. That evil side is to penetrate an organization, to create havoc, sometimes for personal financial gain, and sometimes just because of the psychopathic mindset. Your job, or our job, even what system it is, is how do we identify those people before they invade our system? So think of someone like that. The other is the ideological. The ideological person is that individual who shuns, uh, I don't know, the, the, the sort of restrictions and, and believes that all information, whether it's the technical tools or technology, should be shared with everyone. And uh, I think we've seen that in the past with uh, some pronounced uh, individuals out there. I, I won't give out names. I, I'm not a name dropper. But just think back of some of the most recent cases of individuals that are more ideological. They're doing it. They're, they, they're invading or penetrating a system because they think there's wrongdoing. And everybody should have that. The third category I, I mentioned here is the government sponsored. Um, sometimes the government gives them em or empowers that individual. Sometimes that individual obviously is working within a sophisticated system. Uh, they're backed by the government, in, in, even in organizations, sometimes organized crime. And sometimes it's direct, sometimes it's indirect. The idea is that, again, they look for the weaknesses and the flaws and the vulnerabilities. And they do, in essence, have that sort of enhanced social skills, that ability to manipulate others. So again, a, sad, a third category of person that uh, one should be aware of. And the last is the revengeful. And I look at them as the insider threat. And a lot of times we tend to forget about that. We forget about the, the people that we sit next to. We forget about the fact that we're sort of all in this together. But yet there may be that odd out, that individual who may not necessarily feel that he's being or she's being valued. That's the insider threat. That insider threat, that person can feel pissed off. He could feel or she could feel mistreated. He or she could feel misunderstood, disgruntled, and angry, whether it's their company, whether it's their, it's their government, and they strike out. And the idea is how do we identify the four types of, of crackers or bad actors that invade our workplace? Next slide, please. To look at motivations, and, and again, I, I think it's just as important as some of the uh, profiles that we look at, um, with motivations helps us to identify some of those categories, or some of those individuals in those categories. And the idea that generally speaking, um, I, I speak of the love of the challenge is, is sometimes intoxicating and doing what others can do and the challenge of the event. The, the respect you get from others within the community and with specifically within this hacker community, because that within itself is a community that uh, thrives on each other. It's, it's like being someone who joins an organization, who joins a group, who, who wants to belong. And that's a very powerful thing. People are motivated by many different things, but to be an affiliate sometimes entices someone to join an organization that may not be in his or her best interest, and again, uh, to, to hack or to penetrate a system. Next slide, please. The intellectual, again, I speak of intellectual challenge. I talk about the ethos of the hacker community, um, that there should be a level of playing field in society. That person, again, feels that there should be no restrictions, and the world should have access to information in a highly conspiratorial society. Next slide, please. So I'm sure everyone in the audience is probably thinking this. At this point, everyone is thinking, why is it important for me to understand this? Now, all the other things that you've heard this morning is clearly in relationship to what you are hoping to do in any program. You, you go to SIT, you want to get a master's degree in behavioral computers or as engineering, and you're thinking this guy is talking about hacking into a system. 
why is this important to me? And for those who are interested in cybersecurity and thinking about, well, defeating those individuals from, from penetrating your system, the more you know and understand the threats, the better chances you'll have to manage and defeat it. That's number one. Two, it's critical to arm cyber professionals, and that are those that are in the audience, but I say in general. The more you know, the more powerful you become, especially with the human tools, knowledge to, to devise new security strategies. It's one thing to be technically attuned, and there's another thing to be able to communicate what you know and be able to work within different environments with different people. You have to understand the human dynamics. Anything that's made by man, any machine, there is the person behind it. My job, or what I'm trying to share, is getting to know the person behind it. Now, what does that require from you? It requires, obviously, training. It requires your awareness, and it requires practice. Communication is something that we must practice. In today's technology, we sort of get away from that human interaction. Instead of going um, or calling someone on the phone, we text them. The other thing I want to say that's also very unique about the, the bad actor, the hacker, the cracker, if I show you this, this instrument here, this instrument here is a phone, and I would ask you in the audience, the normal person would say, yeah, this is very simple. It's a telephone. What do you do with it? You make calls. You give this to someone that's a hacker or cracker. It's not about the fact that it's a telephone and the fact that you make calls on it. That inquisitiveness of that person is, what if I take this thing apart and determine and see that there's things here that what else can I do with it? What else can, 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 can make this different? The hacker is curious and that curiosity obviously carries over into things. Unfortunately, sometimes we, we, we have troubles or have problems. Um, the more we understand, the better chance to manage critical arms to the cyber professional with human tools, knowledge, device, new security strategies, requires training, awareness, and practice, and yet requires global partnership among cyber professionals to develop an understanding of the threats and how to manage and defeat it. Next slide, please. Um, and I'll try to move through these as quickly as I can. Um, as cyber attacks, uh, and, and, and again, I, I wanna say one thing before I move into my closing, is my recommendation or what I want for cyber workforce to be taught or develop a keen understanding of the psychological mindset and personality and behavioral attributes of a hacker and cracker. Second, once the cyber workforce understands and learns the various preferred self-image and persona, that the hacker and or cracker strives to present to the workforce and public, this will provide clues for you to sort of find the thematic representation the hacker and cracker would find most offensive in or psychologically disruptive. These images help prepare you, prepare you and provide the workforce the necessary clues to, um, to learn and combat the threat. In closing, as a cyber attack and become more sophisticated, and are growing exponentially, um, the cyber workforce is striving to strengthen and sustain the talents needed to protect, detect, defend, respond to these attacks, and they need to continue to develop their skill sets. And as I said, this unfortunately is a topic that is always last. It's a topic that are not giving a lot of thought to, but it's something that could change your organization and either make it move forward or destroy it completely. I thank you very much. I've run out of time, and I'll turn it back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. That was uh, extremely interesting, seeing hacking from a completely different perspective. Um, let me just introduce the other members of the panel. Um, we have Candid and Vasily. Candid is a cyber protection specialist who has been working with a cyber protection, very many cyber protection companies during his career, and he is at the other end of the hacker um, war. Uh, then we have the view uh, from a student of computer science, our own student, uh, Vasily Zorin, who is uh, now studying a master's of science in Singapore at our partner university, the National University of Singapore. So, 
Um, guys, I'd like to get into the talk. Um, uh, Barry, <laughs> seeing that you're used to um, all night interrogations, <laughs> what at the end of the day would you recommend people who are going into cybersecurity or to protect against cybercrime, what should they be learning in addition to their skills in technology? Well, I, I, I do, Christian, think that the, the current weakness that I see in the lack of awareness of, of again, cyber career opportunities and is training standards is, is truly understanding the significance and importance of human dynamics, human behavior. And I think that's one thing that's missed. And, uh, you know, I, I see it all the time. We, we, we put a great deal of effort in, as we should, in the actual tools that we're learning. But I think we're losing so much of the human aspect of, of how people behave. And I think that works not only in, this, in, in just the science of it, I think that also works as a business person. How do you translate that in, into meeting people and, and, and to business? And, and so the more so you, you're basically saying, Barry, you need to understand your enemy. Well, absolutely. So doing it. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Candid, can I, can I switch to you, um, you know, as the expert in cybersecurity? I mean, what types of, of cybercrime do you see? What types of malware? And, and, you know, and how is, uh, how, what's the trend in this area? Yeah, I mean, the type of attack, of course, depends on the motivation of the attacker, like Barry said, right? So cyber criminals who are after monetary gains, they probably will use malware as in computer viruses to steal your credit card or maybe encrypt your data and then held it hostage. And on average, we actually see around 300,000 new computer viruses every day. Wow. And yes, of course, not all of them are completely different in function. So it's more like a variation. Maybe you can think of it as a, a birthday present, right? It has a different wrapper around it. So the color is different. You can shake it. But inside, it's still the same toy with the same functionality. And usually that toy, or in that case, computer virus, is distributed through emails. So about one in 200 emails is actually malicious. And that means there's tens of millions of malicious emails being sent around every day. And we all know it takes only one user to open the attachment, to click it, to then get compromised and infect themselves. So that's kind of the, the simple way for cyber criminals. But there are, of course, also sophisticated attacks. So more the nation state actors, like Barry said, they're more into espionage and sabotage attacks. Um, they might actually use the same techniques to compromise machines. Because just think about it, right? Why would they use something very complicated if just guessing the password of a sysadmin is already good enough and successful? I mean, why waste the effort? But yes, um, for more difficult targets, they can use additional things like vulnerabilities. So flaws in software code, which they can misuse to then execute their own code. Okay. And probably one of the most uh, famous example was Stuxnet. Uh, which my team helped discover back in 2010. So Stuxnet was one of the first global cyber attack which actually had a real impact on the physical world because the aim was to attack and disrupt the uranium enrichment facility in Iran. So it's a clear kind of cyber warfare or cyber attack which brings up on so many levels. They used um, a lot of different vulnerabilities to go into the networks uh, and then attack the industrial control system, but they also used uh, USB sticks to hop from one machine to another, because of course some of those systems are just protected. So quite complex and sophisticated. Okay, so these complex attacks, do they always come you know, th through the web or, or, or do they also utilize the, the, the human users of those networks? A lot of those attacks, of course, make use of so-called social engineering. So they misuse the human aspect um, because if you put some urgency, the weakest link often is the human, right? They will open the attachment or they will pick up the USB stick from the uh, parking garage and plug it in because they're curious, they want to help. So that can actually be used to then kind of jump into it. So that works for simple attacks like phishing, which might only take about 10 minutes to set up compared to the sophisticated attacks like Stuxnet, which 
probably took about 10 people for six months and 1 million US dollars as a budget. And even then they still made some mistakes. So there's various levels. Okay, so understanding how the hacker uh, uh, psychologically thinks and how he manipulates you as the user for his needs is, is also a crucial element of cybersecurity. That's Absolutely, because in oh, the end, okay. the attackers are very creative in finding new ways in bypassing existing securities. So you have to think like a hacker in order to actually prevent them. Very cool. So Vasily, uh, you as a student uh, and, uh, of computer science and also with a focus on cybersecurity, are you being taught any of these elements? Um, basically, I, I would say that we have been told two aspects. First is technical, which includes uh, like standard uh, uh, elements like uh, confidentiality, integrity, availability principles, and uh, like the most popular attacks and how to prevent them. Uh, we also touched such topics as uh, application of AI technology technologies uh, and how they can be used to detect some uh, malware activities or prevent uh, uh, cyber crimes. Um, and also we uh, studied uh, two very interesting concepts of decentralized uh, applications and uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, these two com uh, concepts are based fully on blockchain technology and actually they have such a built-in uh, security so they are more stable to the attacks from the people side um, uh, first of all we studied how to incorporate uh, such uh, uh, information security policies into the behavior of people because it's not just uh, it's not about just writing information security policies but uh, the question is how to change people's behavior, how to uh, change the pattern so that this can become uh, like a personal hygiene, not to open uh, strange links or how to check uh, that this email could be a phishing email or something. And uh, another uh, important aspect is about how we can ensure that we don't have like bad person in uh, software development teams and uh, uh, how to integrate some checks into our uh, software development process like uh, random code review or uh, external audit to ensure that the product that we develop is uh, secure enough and don't uh, uh, have any back doors. Super. That sounds like a pretty extensive study that you have. So Candid, from your point of view as, as an employer of people, uh, what would you like to have you know, them to be taught before they come and work for you? I think it's important that the students understand that they have to look at security as a whole. And that means, of course, as Vasily said, Security has to be a crucial part from the beginning in the development process when building something and not just kind of sprinkled on top of it at the end, right? It has to be at the beginning because otherwise it will usually fail. And it also has to be kind of multidisciplinary. So it's very complex systems nowadays, right? So it's not just the software. There's also the physical security aspect. And of course, the human aspect, as Barry said, and all of it has to be integrated and taught so that the overall system will be secure. Mm. And now with the, you know, we've heard about this from, from leading experts in, in quantum physics, building quantum computers. Um, we had a speaker who invented quantum cryptography at our, one of our last uh, insights events. I mean, with the onset of quantum crypt cryptography, I mean, that's supposed to be unhackable, right? So will everybody be out of business? Well, I guess the short answer is unfortunately no. Um, History has shown us that even strong cryptography um, will usually be poorly implemented. So there might be some weaknesses that can be misused by the attacker. But let's, for the sake of argument, assume it's unbreakable, it's well implemented. Well, it's still just one part of a whole complex system, right? So the attackers will just wait till you actually need to perform some work on the data, which means you need to decrypt it or work in some other way on it. And then we then just shift to the weakest link and attack it there. 
And we all know the weakest link very often is the human. So unfortunately, we won't be out of jobs. So it's still a good time to study computer science. Okay, cool. And Barry, I mean, is it possible to track people that are, you know, doing cyber crime based on profiling like you would do with other criminals? Um, yeah, yes. I mean, it, it has been done. I mean, once you've identified, and, and I think each student has to learn, it, my belief in, in the studies at SIT is case studies, case studies yeah. of individuals who actually have done it and to follow certain behaviors. And it'll lead you to the, the, the physical piece of it. And, and let me just say this one thing, is that, is there a, a crackable or uncrackable system? As long as there's a human element behind it, in my opinion, it's crackable. Because I'm not gonna go after the system, I'm gonna go after the person behind the system. I want access to what you have, Christian. So I'm not worried about the software that you have. I am going to in some way befriend you. I'm gonna find out what your weakness, what your flaw, what your vulnerabilities are and what you need in your life. And if I can do that and persuade you to maybe take a flash drive that I have and insert it into your system or whatever to get what I need or to penetrate that, that hardware is what I do. So again, to sort of answer, in my opinion as a behavioralist, I am gonna go after the person, if that makes sense. Cool, that does totally make sense. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Um, this was, um, for me, a very interesting panel to moderate because we did look at aspects which are not so usual in the context of this subject. And thank you very much for your participation and handing back to Mark. Christian, thank you very much. Thank you for moderating yet another compelling panel on this very special day, this virtual nano conference when SIT has launched this new MSc, this wonderful new MSc in uh, computer science and software engineering. It's the Q&A part, part of the event now and uh, we're going to have Dr. Sergei Belousov, who of course is the CEO, founder of SIT, Professor Mara Petze, Professor of Software Engineering at Schaffhausen Institute of Technology, and Vasily, who's just on the last panel. He's a student. Who better to hear about the, the current SIT format technology experience? And someone that's there, he of course is at the National University of Singapore as well. If you have any more questions, press that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We still have time to ask questions to our illustrious panelists. Dr. Bella Ossoff, if I can ask you a question from one of our attendees, does SIT plan to have its own MSc program in artificial intelligence? Uh, <clears throat> I'm a very boring person. I don't believe there is a special field of artificial intelligence. I think artificial intelligence is part of computer science and software engineering. Artificial intelligence itself is not a separate science, at least not at the moment. Uh, it's a tool which you can use to build better programs, uh, better machines, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, better human systems. Uh, and, you know, studying artificial intelligence started from the father of computer science, one of the fathers of computer science, which is Alan Turing, who actually probably coined the world. And so I think, uh, yes, we, we have artificial intelligence. It's underlying discipline in everything we do in software engineering and computer science, but at the moment, it's not a separate science. Okay. No, it's a separate master of science. Thank you, Dr. Bella Usov. If I can ask the next question to Professor Petze. Professor Petze, will it be possible to be a student while working full time? Tell us about this remote learning program. Oh, yes, it is possible. In a nutshell, it's complicated, but it is possible. Uh, we do have this uh, completely new idea, which is not just e-learning, but it is actually flip blended remote uh, e-learning, which means uh, you can sit in a class physically or virtually, you can participate to the work physically or virtually, you can attend the classes offline and online. So it is possible indeed to participate to classes without being physically in Schaffhausen most of the time. So it is compatible for, with remote work uh, across the world. Uh, in the future, we will also have uh, remote campuses to give access to students. Right now, we are building them. Uh, of course, master requires time and time and effort. So I think you know it's important for uh, the, the for a master full time 
for a full-time employee to have uh, a mutual agreement between SAP and the company so that uh, the person will have the time and effort to dedicate to the master as well. Which, uh, but I think, yes, it is fully compatible. Anybody interested, we are very happy to start with that in order to build a future collaboration plan. Thank you, Professor Messi. Vasily, if I can bring you in, you're a student at SIT. Who better to ask about the experience, the SIT experience? What for you sets it apart? What is it about the place, the format, the experience, the ethos that sets it apart from other courses, other universities? Uh, yeah, uh, I think the most interesting part of SIT is this um, great mixture of different people with different backgrounds. So we have uh, very experienced uh, experts from the industry. We have uh, high level scientists from uh, computer science, from physics, uh, from information security, and uh, we can contact them and uh, ask our questions, work with them on uh, scientific work, or maybe uh, do some industrial projects. So, uh, and this is uh, the great um, exchange of ideas between people with different backgrounds and this generates really great insights. Thanks, Vasily. Dr. Belousov, I have another question from one of our attendees. Lots of questions are flooding in. The question is, what are the technological capabilities of SIT, what laboratories are available? Do all students have access to all the laboratories? So we are building the laboratories. We are collaborating with Carnegie Mellon and in the US where you have access to uh, uh, very high-end laboratories, of course, in both cases are very well-funded universities with any laboratories you can possibly imagine with different research centers. Uh, we are going to announce another collaboration with the university in Europe soon. So uh, in terms of our laboratories, we're a new university. We are going to probably build uh, several physics laboratories, five to 10 over the period of the next three to five years. Uh, we also are not very far from, I mean, you know, it's a general question. The, the, the answer is that if you think about computer science, for example, uh, and software engineering, you typically don't need laboratories. What you need is you need uh, actually access to computers and access to internet and that you definitely have if you think about cloud computers quantum computers uh, there was uh, a question in in the background uh, when would quantum computers be available they're available today but they're available in the cloud so again in order to access quantum computers you need to have access to internet uh, we will definitely have very very good internet multiple connections we will protect it with acronis products so you will have access to any laboratories you need to study software engineering and computer science. When we start physics, you will have physics laboratories. Thanks, Dr. Belousov. Uh, Professor Petsy, if I can fire another question at you, they're coming from all sides. One of our attendees asks this, I have already had uh, an MSc in electronics and I'd like to join SIT as a researcher. H how could I join for a PhD? Well, we do have a PhD program started already. We have a few students and, uh, you know, to start the PhD program, just send an application to, uh, to, to me uh, or to uh, Bertrand Meyer, the, the, the provost, and we will evaluate the, the, the candidates and we do have a lot of uh, positions for good PhD students. Yeah, so if we have any questions that we don't answer during this Q&A, please make sure you do ask SIT, don't be shy. Please ask any questions you have, fire those questions to SIT on the website and they'll be sure to get back to you. Vasily, if I can just ask you about the sort of Singapore versus Schaffhausen experience, compare and contrast. Um, first of all, climate. <laughs> <laughs> because it's uh, always warm here. Um, um, I don't think that there is some const uh, contrasts between these two uh, universities. It's more about like um, uh, teamwork uh, because it's a double degree program. Uh, so uh, 
uh, currently I'm studying at NUS, uh, but at the same time we have uh, uh, close contacts with Professor Mayer, with uh, Professor Pesci, and we also uh, very closely interact with uh, with them. So, uh, and that's really uh, inspiring that uh, we have such opportunity to like if we have any question we can not just uh, ask them to our supervisors of dissertations, for example, but also ask our uh, professor in Schaffhausen. So um, I don't think that there is like a con contrast. Uh, it's more about teamwork. Yeah, and the, doc, Dr. Bella Usov, this, this is my question. Th this link between the board and the students, the ability of the students to get access to the boards, the many boards networks, that seems to be something that really sets you apart at SIT. Yes, that's a very important uh, part uh, of what we do is we believe, for example, for me, my alma mater, um, uh, which I joined uh, in Soviet Union, Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, uh, gave me primarily access to the very good scientists and very good students. And that's what we want to make. Um, luckily, with modern technology, you can organize it. You can make it much, much easier for people. <clears throat> you know, one of the problems of busy board members is that they're all over the world. Uh, we can use modern technologies, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, even banal things like <coughs> Zoom to get them to, to be able to be present at a very high quality in virtual conferences, in um, discussions. We also can and will organize our software with a very specialized learning management system, which would enable uh, blended learning experience where you can learn some online, some offline, and you can communicate with different people in the part of learning. And so that's a unique thing which we organize um, with science and technology to learn science and technology. And that is a very, very unique thing. And so to answer one of the previous questions, um, uh, we technically are very much interested in any talented people with any background. And if we find a person who we believe is very talented with our uh, ingenuity and resourcefulness, we can get things organized, whether it relates to labs or uh, professors uh, or courses, uh, we have very much catered towards most talented people who can uh, be on the right of this slide uh, at some point. And if we find such people, we will do everything in our power to make them successful. Professor Petse, if I can ask you another question that's been uh, asked by one of our attendees. In your opinion, how soon will today's education program become more classic and less modern, less applicable? Oh, I'm sort of, I thought I was expecting the opposite direction, the opposite question, because I think our today education is classic. I mean, <laughs> we would actually, <laughs> so I would actually say we are doing our best to actually move from classic education to, uh, to, to modern education. You know, uh, I, I spent a semester in Singapore recently. I attended the class and the course and the workshop to actually learn how to actually work on flip learning, which means learning by experience in class and studying offline, working in group, working in team. And what we will do today in SIT is we will actually globalize this experience by having people sitting virtually in the classroom. I think, you know, maybe the answer is uh, the COVID-19 with the many bad things that uh, brings us, it's also the opportunity to really exploit and benefit from the, from the networking that we had already available for many years, but I think it has been sort of exploited in a very superficial way. You know, you get the MOOCs, the denies, very, very, very professional people who speak, 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 speak like I do. But it don't work with people, you know, while we try to actually use that to work together. So I think, I don't know whether I answered the question because that's actually, but I think it's, it, the revolution is now. We are moving from classic education, professors standing in front of you and talking, 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 and the students listening or sleeping towards students and professors working together to build the next generation of technical leaders. Dr. Belosov, if I can ask you the final question, you are the self-proclaimed mother of this course and of course, 
the university as well. I'm sitting here as a student and I'm thinking, okay, there are many MSCs in computer science and software engineering. There are many high level exclusive universities and colleges who are providing such a course. Why should I come to Schaffhausen? Why should I come to the university that you founded? So first of all, I, I just wanted to say that everything we talked about today connects to this uh, interesting philosophical question, existence of fathers and mothers. Uh, they only exist to offer a choice. So in the world when there is no choice, there is no fathers and mothers. There is just one species which multiplies and there is no choice. It's a similar species which are produced. But in the world of fathers and mothers, you actually have choice, mistakes. You need to do quality assurance. You can have privacy. You need uh, cyber protection, cyber security. Uh, people can be behave in a weird way. And that's the world we live in. We have fathers and mothers. In the Schaffhausen, we believe in knowledge. Uh, there is no choice about knowledge. You just have to have it. And why should you come? In my opinion, primarily because you're ambitious. If you're ambitious, you don't actually care for the brands. You care for what specifically you need to do from point A to point B. How do you get a Turing Award? What kind of research you need to do to get a Turing Award? How do you get a Nobel Prize? What do you need to think of and what kind of research and how and where you need to do to get a Nobel Prize? And what do you need to do to build a billion dollar company? Uh, you know, these guys, they build a trillion dollar company. So that's a you know, very ambitious goal, but they started from building a billion dollar company. So perhaps you should start from that as well, building a billion dollar company. If you're ambitious, uh, that is why you come to us. We can help you. We have all the same and better people and much more attention and much more flexibility than any university you can find in terms of actually achieving those very specific goals. Dr. Belarusov perfectly put in a perfect summary, a perfect way to conclude today's day. I want to thank our three panelists for answering all those brilliant questions. Thank you, audience. Thank you, attendees, for being with us throughout today's first virtual nano conference. It's been an absolutely fascinating two and a half hours. We had a media round table prior to this as well. So it's been a wonderfully busy morning. I want to just say an enormous thanks to our other speakers and our other panelists today who have enriched today's virtual nano conference. It's been an absolutely historic first for SIT this this, this virtual nano conference, and we're so happy to have hosted this today on this special day, the day of the launch of this Masters of Science program, this computer science and software engineering. Just a couple of events, SIT loves to hold events. Please stay tuned, check out the website for these couple of events that are on the horizon. The Sit Star Contest, June 1st to 7th. It's to promote interest in the field of computer science, software engineer, engineering. And what it does is it gives students an opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge of programming. And most importantly, to be considered for a fully funded graduate scholarship. You can see the little click at the bottom. Please, please apply to that, attend that June 1st to 7th. And something a little further ahead, November, but you know what time's like, it'll happen quickly. November 12th to 13th, we've got the SIT Insights and Technology Annual Conference for science, for business, for students. We've got world leading speakers. It's your access to the latest technical developments and educational changes. It's been an absolute honor to be your host, to be your moderator today. Thank you all. You, the attendees, you're the stars. You stuck with us. You ask those brilliant questions as many students who maybe will be attending SIT in the future. If you have any further questions, don't hesitate to ask us at SIT. We'll always answer your questions. Thank you again to the speakers. Thank you again to all our panelists. And a final goodbye to you all. Have a fantastic rest of day.